Where you guys sit? <laughs> you don't sit? Is this the uh, mic? Oh, oh, I got it. Oh yeah, I don't try right. to. I don't speak Spanish. I uh, mean, I. Uh, it's very nice to be here. Let's see if this works. Yeah, it's already ready. Just put it in. It's the all set. Yeah. Hey, stick it in. Like that. Like that. Who's gonna do it? I'm not very good with the technical things. <laughs> Mr. DeVita, can you hear me? As my... Mr. DeVita, can you hear me? Mr. DeVita, can you hear me? Mr. <laughs> now? It's okay? Who's talking? Somebody talk. Mr. DeVita, can you hear me? No, I can't. It's a little bit louder. Can you... okay, you've got a volume there. You've got vol you can make it there now can you hear me this is just testing from the booth okay all right lovely good on you ya está bien it's okay hey, that's right okay bien pues si os parece well let's start the press conference bueno, es un inmen it's a great pleasure to, for the San Sebastian Film Festival, and also for me, I must say it personally, to introduce the first Donosi Award this evening, which will be granted to him. Danny DeVito, I don't think he needs any presentation. He's an actor, director, screw, screenplay writer, hero, villain, many, many things at the same time. So, uh, cast questions, please. Who? Hi, congratulations for your career award. Welcome to San Sebastian, a city that you've been in in the past, it seems. Could you tell us, well, how do you feel to receive the Donosti Award going back? And could you go in depth, and congratulations, by the way, could you go in depth and what does it feel like to receive this award and talk about the background from where you started until you came here? All right. Okay. I, first of all, I'm very, very excited to receive the award. I was pleased, uh, I guess it was a couple months now, that uh, somebody called and, and uh, immediately I said, yes, I won't. this was such an honor. Uh, you guys are uh, very famous all over the world, and uh, it is really, uh, uh, it's an honor for me to receive it. And uh, I'm looking forward to tonight to see everybody. I, I've been working for a long time in the film business, um, and uh, it's always been um, exciting. You know, from the very first day I got a job as an actor, and, and you know, you, how how it is is uh, I always keep um, I think about daily, moment to moment, what's going on. I never really think about the future. Uh, I think about like what is happening now. Most actors, when they get a job, it's the greatest thing in the world. And um, you try to focus on that, that job. And I've done the same thing with all of my um, fortunate career. Um, when I get a part or when uh, I decided to direct and I, uh, and uh, I saw that if I could get to do that, that would be like a great thing. I, I got inspired to do that in um, the 60s when I saw uh, The Battle of Algiers. That was a film that I, uh, the first time I looked at a movie and said, what, what is going on? How does he get to do all this? And, and how can they say there's no actors in it? And, and what is it? What is it that the director does? I didn't really know. You know, I, 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 I went to, to acting school and I got the first courage to step on the stage, which is like, you know, mind blowing. You know, you can't believe it that you're up there in front of like an audience and you're trying to think of all the things that are going on. Plus you're just up there. You know, so forget about that. And then you've got to try to think about the character and how you interact with other with the other actors. And then when I saw that movie, I said, my God, I want to find out exactly what it is that people do to make this happen. Because from the time I was a little boy, 
uh, every Sunday, every Saturday, I spent in the movie theaters. That was like a very, very, very important thing for me. Um, I never once thought when I was a kid, I did envy it. I thought maybe, you know, boy, that's a, a great thing to be Humphrey Bogart or Edward G. Robinson or uh, Jerry Lewis or somebody who, you know, I, I thought was uh, my favorites, uh, the Marx Brothers, go on and on. But I never really had it in my head that I could, uh, I could do it myself uh, until I was about 19 and I went to school. I, I, I said, I got to try dropping everything else and go do this. And uh, I, I lived in Asbury Park, New Jersey. I went to New York. I went to the American Academy of Dramatic Arts. And that's where I got really bit by the by the bug. I couldn't stop. And then I just went to plays and read plays and tried to do things. And wherever I was, I would carry on, you know, and, and try to break that, you know, kind of barrier between myself and the audience. Uh, try to include myself into their life and them into mine. So inspired by you and given like the courage from somewhere, I don't know, to get up there and do it. Uh, that's So moment to moment, everything all through the career has been that. And fortunate then to find um, things like the first time I directed a movie was the, I did a, a, a couple of uh, taxis, which was really the first time I directed. I asked the guys at Taxi if I could do it. We were, it was in our fourth year, I think, and, uh, and I had been thinking about it, but I didn't have the guts to like stand up and say, how about it? Let me take a crack at it. And I had ideas about it, just like every director has ideas about what they want to do. And so I did, and it worked, and it was fun. And once you do it, it's the, that thing of, you know, you get more and more confidence. Uh, but you have to take that first step. It's that that step into the abyss. You know, it's like in any business that you do, whether it's in journalism or it's in, uh, it doesn't matter. It's that, you know, pushing yourself having the confidence to take that first step because you don't know where you're going to land. You don't know if there's anything under you except just emptiness. So you could free fall, you know, and then uh, let's not talk about that. <laughs> but anyway, um, so basically that's, you know, one thing led to another and, uh, you know, and I trust what I feel inside in my gut. You know, and somebody says, uh, this is a, a story that you should look at or a story that you should read or a person that you should meet that has a story to tell. And then once I started directing and I had, in Hollywood, the way it is, you know, the more you, the more power kind of, it's not real, it's kind of real. It's a way to, you know, you just move forward and when I, started making, when I started producing movies, then, uh, you know, I took the, like from the War of the Roses to the, the, the movies that were successful, I took that and parlayed that into Jersey Films and then I got to the point where I could literally, you know, I read a script and uh, it was a script that I loved and I wanted to make and somebody said, they're already making this movie, it's, you missed it. You know, it's like, I said, oh my God. And that was uh, Reservoir Dogs, that was the first, uh, and I said, well, if I can't make this movie, I'd like to meet the guy who wrote it. And it was before it was released. And uh, so they introduced me to Quentin Tarantino and I, and I said to him, I had the meeting, I had a first look deal at uh, TriStar by then and I had, uh, also I had so much crazy, Power, I, I had Final Cut, which was like unheard of in those days. And I said to Quentin, I want to do your next movie. And I, his first movie hasn't been done yet. It's just the editing and it's going to be released. But I said, I loved it so much. He said, okay, I'll, I'll tell you the story. We got along very well. And he said, I'll tell you the story. It's a story about a few intertwining. And I said, I don't, I don't even want to know the story. I said, just go write the script and give it to me when you're done. 
And I knew he was going to promote the Reservoir Dogs all over the world and come and see you guys and come and see everybody. And a year later, he had, I got the script. And it was, as I said, uh, Reservoir Dogs by, it was 155 pages. It was very, very long. It was uh, Reservoir Dogs by Quentin Tarantino, final draft. <laughs> so I took it and I went and uh, made that. But there have been other movies in between. And um, so it's just a matter of like uh, occupying the space and uh, trusting in yourself and a lot of luck. And there you go. Okay, vamos con. con uh, Mr. DeVito, congratulations for the award. I want to ask you a couple of questions. Is it a, a hassle to have to always be nice and a very sympathetic guy through images on this? The, everyone's got an image of you because of the movies that you've made. And the second question is do you've got a good, have you got good memories of our country? Or did you, what did you, in your collection, in your collection, did you, was it, did, had you not come to our country beforehand? Or what memories do you have of our country? Backwards, the first, the first memory I have of your country is uh, my nephew was, uh, I was like uh, the, the responsible adult, which I, my sister, I don't to this day know why she gave me this opportunity, but I was like um, about 22, I guess, or so, and my nephew, was obsessed with the classical guitar. And he loved uh, Andre Segovia. And so uh, there was a, a guy, um, uh, I'm trying to think of it, Ramirez was the name of a, a maker, a guitar maker. And we flew to Spain. She sent me to Santiago de Compostelo, to the big, uh, you know, this big hotel. And because, uh, she said, and I did anything my sister told me. So uh, she's 16 years older than I, and uh, she was like the, my mother, but uh, you know, very, very pushy, my sister. And she said, take uh, your nephew to this. So we went, she bought the tickets. I just came over, I was like amazing, went to Santiago de Capistello, stayed at the hotel. Because on Saturday, this was like a, Tuesday or Wednesday we arrived. On Saturday, Andre Segovia was gonna give a master class and she had enrolled Peter, my nephew, into this master class. So we first went and bought the guitar at this little shop, Ramirez's shop. Took a bus, I remember, I don't even know where it was. Anyways, a beautiful guitar and uh, we went back to the hotel. There was nobody in the hotel. It was like Thursday. Uh, hanging out, eating good food, you know, going by the, you know, having the, sh the shrimps and the fish and the, you know, couple of young people and just walking around. I didn't really know. But Friday came along and I, the hotel was still empty. And there was nobody, I mean, really, my nephew was sitting on the, in the halls. You have, I don't know if you've ever seen it. It's this big, magnificent place, and it was empty. And so he was sit in the middle of the halls trying out his, playing like, uh, you know, Fernando Sor and playing all these different uh, few things that he was practicing. And it sounded like, you know, he was a kid learning, but it sounded great in there. <laughs> But I started to get suspicious. I said to the concierge, I said, it's Friday. When do all the people start coming? Nobody was there. And uh, he said, They're coming to what? And I said, well, tomorrow is the Andre Segovia is giving this master class uh, classical guitar. And my nephew was like really excited about taking it. And he looked at his book. And he said, oh yeah, that was last year. <laughs> so uh, my sister was, you know, just, and I, you know, it's one of the things about it, and that was a good experience because we went, and then we got on a train and we went, we came through uh, France and then went down into Italy and we bought sandwiches through the windows and we had some, you know, the whole thing, experience, went to Rome, walked around Rome and then went home. But the, 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 there's a couple of things about that story. 
One of them relates to uh, uh, Smallfoot. You know, to, and it's because in that instance, I just believed my sister. You know, I, I always did, my sister Angie. And uh, we had a good experience. You know, a lot of times you listen to people who are in authority or older or seeming supposed to be wiser, and uh, they don't, you know, you wind up going down the garden path. And so um, uh, that's one of the themes in, the, in the, our movie that you're going to, you know, the cartoon. It's like really fun. It's very energetic and good. But there are a couple themes. One is about xenophobia, which I thought was great. And the other one is about just blindly following people who tell you that you can bang your head into the wall and the sun will come up, you know, this kind of thing. So. Uh, what was another one part of the question? Yes, about your being very sympathetic. Everyone seems they demand you to be a real. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, whether it's tough or hard. Yeah, you're being a nice. <laughs> it's really hard that you guys like me. I don't know why. I think it's like uh, really, it's been a burden. <laughs> All my fans, um, uh, no, I love it. I think it's great. I think the whole, the whole idea is, uh, you know, when you feel that, come back. You give out and you try to do your best. Everybody strives to, whether they're actors or directors or producers or writers, you know what I mean, or whatever, scenic designers, or cinematographers, doesn't matter. When somebody gives you love back, it's always magnificent. I think one of the things about being on stage with, in, uh, in the theater is you have that immediate response. Last year I did The Price, which was um, Arthur Miller. We did it, I did it on Broadway. And then a few years ago I, would, I did The Sunshine Boys in, uh, at the West End. And it's like when you can do that uh, sometime in your career, and get that feedback, it's like, there's, it's just amazing. When I did Taxi, we had a lot, an audience like you're, the size of the amount of people here right now, every Friday night, and we would rehearse all week, and we would shoot on a Friday night in front of the audience. And we would shoot with three, four cameras, then they would cut around, but when you told the joke, when you got to the punchline, and you got a laugh, eh, Makes you feel like a million bucks. Yeah? Yeah. Hi, Nani. Eh, hola. Hola. ¿Cómo está? Muy bien. Yeah. ¿Y tú? Yeah. Yeah. How are you? How are you? <laughs> I'm okay as well. I'm very pleased to be here. He's speaking in English. For your Donosti Hour. Thank you very much. Um, considering you are a well-known face of the comedy genre, yeah. I would like to know if you believe that uh, festivals mm -hmm. uh, could use a little bit uh, more uh, comedies. Because I believe that uh, we cry a lot. Cry a lot. Love, I love too little. I love to cry. Festival. You love to cry and Mommy, uh... I, I believe that. You like to eat and cry? No, eat. no, 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 I thought you said, because no. I love to eat, too, I eat. Well, I, and I love uh, eat. drink, and I love to cry, it's good to cry. I, I love drink and eat, but during the It's good the, to the cry, festival. though, you got to give crying a little spot, it's very yeah. good, don't, come on, let it out, <laughs> come on, don't, don't, don't give me that macho stuff, come on, you can cry, tell me what's going on. <laughs> You want to lay down? You give him a spot. We we'll lay down and we we'll talk a little bit. I think it's like, uh, yeah. I don't know. I don't, I'm not a, I'm not a uh, connoisseur of the festival. I know that. Uh, I think it's good to have a diverse. Uh, you know, you don't want to always see the same kind of movies. So it's good to open it up to, uh, to uh, you know, comedies and dramas and heartfelt things and scary things and. You know, it's cinema, so let's have a good time. You know, it's the main thing. Yeah. What do you think? You think you, you get too many teary movies and serious movies and yeah, 
No, in, in <laughs> I believe that in, in during the festivals there are more uh, um, films that um, make me cry, and I prefer um, to love. <laughs> You've left me without words, Dan Danny, with what you said. I, 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 I like it uh, for you. Andrew. I'm with you. I understand. What, uh, I know, me. but uh, what, what do you prefer? Now. Do you prefer to do dramas or to do I like I like to cry better, <laughs> especially since I just met him. <laughs> <laughs> this is like, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it's like, uh, yeah, I think it's okay to laugh. It's okay to laugh. You can laugh. He's laughing. There's one laughing right there. It's good to laugh and uh, it's good to cry. And, and I like that you threw the love in there. It's like a good thing, too. A little making love. You know, it's a little bit. Yeah. It's nice. That balance in life. Yeah. Okay. Hi. I want to congratulate you as well. You've played every role, you've produced, you directed, theatre. Any other, spe any, spe any speciality do you feel specially comfortable with and you have more fun with? And then I would like to know, there's a specific moment in the Oscar Awards that I remember years back that you were sitting down in the audience and you were eating a, a carrot. <laughs> and the presenter, I think it was Steve Martin back then, he, see, me traigo, me me y you talk about that moment and talk about the Oscars in general, if you would. If uh, let's, let me, you'll help me with the questions again. But the um, the Oscars are notoriously long. <laughs> you know, I we were all, I was nominated for producing Aaron Brockovich, but that was the only time uh, I was ever nominated and. And I, I don't usually go like to just to go. So and and I've watched them on TV, but they're usually very very long. And everybody said to me, you know, we were celebrating to before we went. We were, we were drinking champagne and having a good time, and it was a very big night because it's like you know a very big honor to be nominated. But everybody kept saying to me, you better eat before you go. And at the last minute, we were leaving the house. I realized I didn't eat. So I went to the table, and there was crudite. There was like carrots and celery and everything. I stuffed it in my tuxedo. <laughs> and then, you know, you go in, and they've got the cameras roaming around. And, you know, you figure, you know, I tried to pick a spot where I could get sneak into the coat and get the carrots and the celery and I got caught <laughs> and uh, I didn't know it. it was on television and then in the next after the next break Steve Martin brought me he came down the stairs and brought me some dip I used it <laughs> I took it I dipped my carrot in there uh, well let's see the other question you asked me <laughs> see, oh. so yours, your yeah what yeah what's your favorite is Oh, yeah, you, you know, you've done everything of all the genres that you've done and, and you know, theatre and this, that. What's the one that you have the most fun with or the one that you, you like the most? It's hard to say. It's like, you know, like in terms of the movies, I like directing. I think it's really a great thing because you go from the beginning and the end. You, you figure it all out and you wind up, you know. But I am an actor and I love acting, so I, it's hard for me to like say, okay, I'm not gonna. I've been doing It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia now for 13 years, and we do it like for three months out of the year. It's kind of hard to schedule things in between. I had a couple breaks. One, I did The Price on Broadway, and the other one, I did The Sunshine Boys because one of the actors in the, the woman, uh, Caitlin, was having a baby, so we took a, time, a little time off. Um, but I, I, um, I also like the business so much, you know, the whole putting everything together and solving some problems if I can contribute to what's going on, trying to get the director's vision on the screen. I like that. So that would be the producing end of it. I'm just a, a glutton for getting in front of the camera. I love to, you know, I'm such a, you know, ham 
I need to get up and do it, you know what I mean? I want to get in front of the camera and, you know how many actors it takes to screw in a light bulb? One. He holds on to the light bulb and the world revolves around him. <laughs> <laughs> so I like that part of the acting thing. And then, you know, and, and uh, directing, producing, and much of the, any of the writing I've done has been with other writers and the director or, you know, maybe adjust the script here and there. Like with uh, uh, The War of the Roses, I work with uh, uh, Michael Leeson and um, uh, on Matilda, I did some of that, but, and so I, it's hard for me to say what, what, I, what I like best. I just like the whole idea of it. this. This is all part of it too. This is like really a joy to be here, to see all the people outside and to hang out with you guys. It's like really a lot of fun. Okay, first of all, congratulations. Uh, you. you are also here presenting a small food, but this is not the first time you have uh, uh, you you have dubbing a, a cartoon character. Right. So uh, my question is regarding your, the work you did in Lorax, which is a film I really like it. Thank you. So if I'm not wrong, you did it in five languages. So my first question is, how did you manage Ooh. that for doing in five languages? It, it, and the other question is, what is the, the thing you most like about dubbing car cartoon films? Okay, well, the... the the thing about the languages, okay, so I did the Lorax, I loved doing it, and I did it, you know, like me, Danny, I mean, I, I pretty much everything I do is like, you know, basically what you, this is what's happening right now, this is, this is me, you know, and it's like, I do it, and I look at it, and I said, wow, this is really terrific, I loved doing the character, and I said, uh, and I got a friend who's a, a German guy, he lives in California, and, um, uh, and it, it dawned on me, I said, I wonder if I could do some of it, like just try it out. So I called the producer um, and I said, I know you're gonna do this in, you know, it's gonna go all over the world. And I don't wanna take a job away from anybody because I know that there are a lot of people in Italy and in Germany and in Spain and they do my voice. I said, but I would like to try it, you know what I mean? Just as a challenge. When I said that, he said, oh, this sounds terrific. I said, well, let me find the toughest one to try a paragraph. And I said, well, I figure Russian would be the toughest one, right? Uh, for some reason, that just popped into my head. It's got nothing to do with, you know, Putin or anything. Uh, so I got a paragraph, one speech, and I hired a, a woman who was... Uh, authentic Russian and I got the microphones and everything set up and phonetically we wrote it all out and she stayed with me and we did it and I did it and did it and did it until I you know felt like it was close she thought she was smiling rather than making a face you know funny and and then I said well geez if I could if it Maybe I could try it in, and I'm Italian, I don't speak Italian very much, but I figured, well, I'll do it in uh, Spanish and in Italian, and then I wanted to do it with the, the, the you know, with your, you know, the, in the, like in the bat, you know, the, you know, say thumb, yeah, with say, yeah, they take out. Say them. I, so I tried it, and I, I said, this is gonna be like a trip. So I took a chunk of time and I did it in every, I did it in uh, the five, mine, uh, English obviously, and then I did it in uh, the two Spanishes, and I did it in Italian, and I did it in German, and I did it in Russian. So, and it was like climbing Mount Everest. <laughs> Ask me if I would ever do it again. <laughs> It was so difficult because, you know, you were, you know, phonetically, and try to get the energy of the character that I had, I did in English, uh, to try to fill the, you know, and I'm sure I butchered everybody's language. I don't know what it sounds like. You've heard it, I'm sure, but uh, 
I went to the only, I think the only place I visited was, I was about to do a play in London. So the only place I could, I went to Moscow because I figured that's, that was the toughest. Let me see it with a Russian audience. And it worked out pretty good. But every day when I took a break for, it took me, I don't know how many months to do it. Every single day, I look myself in the mirror and I say, what the hell are you doing, <laughs> you crazy man? That was a good experience. Uh, and the other question regarding what is the thing you most like about uh, dubbing cartoons? Oh, yeah. Well, um, for, for the movie here, uh, the Lorax, or, the, the idea is the main thing is um, it's not as much fun as being in a room with other actors. You're kind of alone in a booth with a director and the script, and you're giving him a lot of choices, like of different ways, interpretations of the movie. Um, so I did, I did this because of, uh, I thought it, was, it had some good values, and I thought, you know, and I you like to do movies for kids. I've done, I did My Little Pony, I did uh, Hercules, and. The Lorax and Space Jam I had a part in. I mean, I would like to do it for, mainly it's, mainly the most, for the most part it's because you know that kids need that time to smile and parents, boy, they need it more than the kids, <laughs> so. Hi there. Thank you. Hi, I'm here. Here, yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, I watched uh, Small for yesterday, and it was it was lovely. So congratulations Thank on you. that too. Um, but I was thinking as well about: um, Is there anybody you would like to work with? Because you've worked with like everyone. So is there anybody missing? Um, well, I just finished Dumbo. I worked with Tim for last summer, so he's my one of my favorite buddies that, to work with. Um, there's so many people out there that I'd like to work with, but I, uh, but like I said before, when things come to you, you've got gut feeling, you go with it, and you know, I don't really usually think way ahead, like let me plan on doing this or that. Just let it come as moment to moment. So we'll see who I get to work with next. Buenas tardes. Hi, good afternoon. I'm here on the left, there you are. It's an honor to see you here in person. Congratulations for the award that you're going to receive. And you're a great representative of world cinema. My question is, from all of the productions that you've made, of the fantastic productions that you've made, what, what, what more has Danny DeVito got to t show us? Was you know, it's like a mystery. Okay. We don't know. We have no idea. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I'd like to go back on the stage again. If you go, you know, like the thing about that is that I'm spoiled now because I did Neil Simon, I did Arthur Miller, I've done Cuckoo's Nest on the stage. Um, you know, it's hard to find uh, stuff to do like that. I'd like to do more of that. Uh, you know, if I find something to. Uh, project to direct, I would do it. I, I think, um, you know, I don't know. I have no idea what, what uh, is going to happen. So it's good that I'm up here with you guys. I know that right now, I know for a fact that I'm going to pour this water into this glass. <laughs> I keep my promises. <laughs> now, I am going to lift the glass. <laughs> Pay attention, please. Thank you very much. Now it is coming to rest here. It's going to come to my lips, and I'm going to drink it. Vamos con la última pregunta. I tell you that we got to be careful. We've got to be really, really careful. Because this may seem like just a bottle of water to us right now. But in the very near future, I fear that this is be 
going to become more and more valuable. Because if we listen to all the people who are making all the decisions in our life, in our world, they're not going to be thinking about this for our children and our grandchildren and their children. So we have to protect our planet. It's very, very important. And I know that, you know, I come from a country that's turned its back on uh, global warming and turned its back on the Paris Accords and then turned its back on a lot of things. We're in a very, very kind of not a good spot right now. And we're just hoping that we can change that with our midterm elections so that we could at least put the brakes on the destruction that's happening. So with that, I will drink another glass of water because this is so valuable to us. Okay, let's go with the last question. Hi, over here. I would like to ask you, before you would talk about how difficult was it to dub in five, double in five uh, languages, I don't... Man on the Moon with Jim Carrey was that difficult. I saw a documentary that really knocked me away. You worked in Taxi and also with Andy Kaufman. Could you talk a bit about where the Man on the Moon is all real and and how working working uh, uh, with a genius when you started off in comedy with Andy Kaufman, how did that mark your career? Andy was a uh, uh, very, 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 very great artist. Andy was um, a master of like uh, he, he was a control, he, ma he could control the energy in a room just by walking into the room. And it was like really uncanny. I experienced it for five years on Taxi. Um, there's no way that you can duplicate art like that. Uh, we tried to represent it with Milos and with Jim and with everything. But there is no way to really experience, um, and too bad Andy's gone, uh, but I tell you from experience, my, ex my direct experience with him, that and it's very hard to kind of translate into any language, just, that if Andy walked into a room, right now if he walked into this room, what we've been doing is like all very natural to us and normal and we, we're digging it, we're having a good time and it's lots of fun. And Andy wasn't a wet blanket. He was just something that you've never seen before. You've never experienced the energy of Andy walking on this stage what he would do to me without, he didn't have to touch me or be, or you. It would just change what's going on inside of us. It's like walking through a, um, like a kind of a, a, a misty kind of like uh, uh, altered state. And he had this talent that was not, it was just him. He, it's true that his silences were the most effective, but it's very hard for me to explain. I watched him uh, do all of his antics and all of his craziness. I literally was, like on stage with him, he was playing my brother in Taxi, but he wasn't there. I, 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 it's very hard to explain. It's like telling, I'm not a physicist. I don't know how I could tell you like about the mechanics of the universe, but I do know that when there's a moment where art happens, like when somebody's, whether they're painting or whether they're sculpting or whether they're performing or whatever, there's that moment where it happens and I, and we were, every once in a while, we're lucky to be in the presence of it. And I was in a good spot and very fortunate 
to have known Andy, a, a brilliant artist. And if you ask me what his art was, I couldn't tell you. Okay, pues estoy seguro de que muchos... I'm sure that many of the people here are also moved to have been in the presence of Danny DeVito. And so this is the end of the press conference. A big round of applause. Thank you.